In the next few minutes, we're going to look for the gaze. So the gaze is not what we think it is. It is not the look. And we should think about the gaze in terms of the way it relates to the look. So the gaze is the point in the visual field where this field takes the subject's look into account. The point at which the subject's desire transforms the structure of the visual field. This distortion in what the subject sees is the gaze. So the gaze is an object, not the subject looking. And because the gaze marks the point at which the subject's desire manifests itself visually, it has the ability to disrupt the subject's look and make clear that the subject is part of the world that it assumes to be purely external. So the opposition between me looking at something and this something I'm looking at breaks down and I realize that I'm part of what I'm looking at, that my look is actually taken into account by what I'm seeing. So the importance of the gaze is manifested most clearly in cinema, where we can see that the gaze has a clear political importance. And politics in general depends on us understanding that we're involved in what we see and the field that we're perceiving, that we can't separate ourselves from it. And that's what cinema, when it deploys the gaze, allows us to see. So the importance of recognizing the gaze in cinema is the importance of cinema as a political art. We can look at this painting by Diego Velasquez, and we can see an example of the gaze. Here the gaze is not the look of the painter or the couple in the mirror, the royal couple in the mirror being painted that we see in the background. Instead, it's this black space, the back of the canvas that we see. So this, it's the point in the image where we're drawn into what we're seeing. We can't separate ourselves from what we see. The point of the gaze is the point at which the visual field reveals its non-neutrality. The fact that it's distorted by the desires that constitute it. And one of those desires is mine, insofar as I am one of the people looking at it. And this is true in every film, because film always has to take into account the desire of the spectator. And the point at which the desire of the spectator is included in the film is the gaze. And the gaze is also the site of what's political about the cinema. So even though cinema is the site for numerous ideological fantasies as a result of commercial and other pressures, it nonetheless has the potential to include and depict and reveal the gaze as a site of rupture, a rupture within the ideological fantasy that destroys the ideological fantasy. And in a certain sense, cinema is privileged over all the other visual arts because it's so invested in fantasy. And it's through fantasy that we arrive at the point of the gaze. So even though fantasy covers over the gaze, it also gives us a pathway to the gaze. So ideological fantasies betray the gaze, but fantasy as such gives us the path to the gaze. So the phantasmatic narrative that cinema produces speaks directly to the spectator's unconscious. And this is why we're able to encounter the gaze in cinema, because cinema allows us to see things that if we're consciously looking, we wouldn't look for. But because cinematic narratives speak to our unconscious, they enable us to encounter the gaze in a way that we can't in other art forms, where consciousness and our consciousness controls the look to such an extent. This is true in theater or in painting. So in theater, we have to use our imagination to complete the set that theater leaves bare. So fantasy plays a limited role in theater. In contrast to theater, film bays the spectator in fantasy throughout the viewing experience. This is why one does not require a great imagination to watch a film, because the film supplies the entire fantasy for the spectator. This is why people think theater is a superior art to film often, because it relies much more on the spectator's activity, whereas in film, the spectator is in a passive role. But it's actually this passivity that allows encounter with the gaze in cinema that doesn't happen quite so easily in theater. The encounter with the gaze is a moment at which 
the aesthetics and the politics of cinema come together. So the great films aesthetically are also the great films politically because they allow the encounter with the gaze. And what we think of as greatness in cinema is precisely this encounter with the gaze, as I'll try to show. The central role that the gaze plays in film results in the fact that most films function ideologically to protect the spectator from the threat of the gaze that's imminent in the filmic art. Popular cinema has largely taken upon itself to shelter spectators from the trauma of the gaze and to assure them that they can enjoy a, enjoy a film without encountering any manifestation of their own desire. If the essence of cinema involves the confrontation with the gaze, the betrayal of this essence constitutes the most fundamental filmic practice. And here is one example. So La La Land has to manifest the gaze in some way, but it also covers over the gaze so that the spectator doesn't have to experience the sustained encounter with its own desire. So the spectator's desire manifests itself through an emergence of an absence in the filmic image, an absence indicating that the film has taken the spectator's desire into account. There is no film that doesn't deploy the gaze because if it didn't deploy the gaze at all, it would never appeal to the spectator's desire and no one would come to see it. But most films, like La La Land, obscure the gaze by creating a sense of filmic reality complete unto itself so that we can watch as spectators from a safe distance. The gaze prevents the spectator from watching the film from a safe distance because it in indicates the inclusion of the spectator in what she or he sees. So the possibility for the encounter with the gaze is the political kernel of cinema hidden in most popular cinema. The gaze is the interruption of the look and popular cinema likes to sustain the look and hide the gaze. But there are films that manifest the gaze and disrupt the look. One must be looking in order to see the gaze, but the gaze interrupts the look. The gaze is both a product of the subject's look and a disruption of it. When we look, most often we see only images, a visual field that seems coherent and self-contained. In this sense, the look is fundamentally deceptive. It is only when the gaze emerges as a distortion of the visual field that we become aware of the incoherence of this field and its reliance on us as the ones who see it. So the gaze makes clear that we, as someone looking at the scene, are part of the scene, that we, our desire, constitutes the scene, and without that desire, the scene would not exist. So every film depicts a confrontation between the gaze and the image, but typically the image obscures the gaze to the point where we cannot recognize it, typically, but not always. So if we look at two of the consensus great films in the history of cinema. We can look at the sight and sound list of the top 10, and we can just pick the first two. For some reason, Vertigo got elevated above Citizen Kane on the most recent list. That had to be a mistake in polling because it couldn't possibly be the collective wisdom of film critics and, and film people. Nonetheless, uh, both films are effective in the way that they show the gaze, although Citizen Kane is superior. So these encounters with the gaze that are depicted in Vertigo and Citizen Kane, and the rest of these films, to be fair, are the high points of cinema precisely because they mark the point at which the aesthetics and the politics of cinema come together. That is, the point at which film exposes and makes clear the gaze is the most radical political point of cinema, and it's the aesthetic high point at the same time. So, what the great films in cinematic history are able to do is to reveal the gaze while still manage to, managing to create an image that engages the spectator. For this reason, the aesthetic high points of cinema are also its political high points, points at which cinema forced spectators to recognize their involvement in what they see and ultimately to abandon the everyday pose of neutrality relative to the visual field. So we can look at this in the case of Vertigo. So the encounter with the gaze in Vertigo comes at the moment when Scotty, who's the main character, discovers that the woman he's fallen in love with never existed. 
So Scotty trails a woman he believed to be Madeline Elster, the spouse of an old friend, Gavin Elster, who hired him to follow her. But this woman is actually Judy, hired by Gavin to play Madeline and seduce him. Gavin warns Scotty that Madeline appeared possessed by the spirit of Carlotta Valdez, her great-grandmother, who committed suicide, and he says that he fears Madeline will repeat the same act of self-harm. After Scotty and Madeline fall in love in the wake of a first-stage suicide attempt, she apparently kills herself by jumping from a bell tower. But in fact, Gavin has thrown the real Madeline from the tower as Judy arrived at the top, and because Scotty has vertigo, he couldn't follow her up. So Gavin staged everything, including Scotty's desire for Madeline, in order to do away with his wife. At this point in the film, Scotty is not aware of the plot, but he feels devastated at the loss of what he considered his great love. Later, however, Scotty spots Judy on the street and notices her remarkable, remarkable resemblance to Madeline, of course, because she is Madeline. They begin seeing each other, and when he has her change her appearance to more fully approximate the lost Madeline, he finds this version fully satisfying. Hitchcock dep depicts the perfect fantasy moment, and let's take a look at it. This is such a great moment of depiction of fantasy because even at the height of the realization of fantasy, Scotty has, as we see the tracking shot go around them in this 360 degree motion, Scotty sees the mission where at the, at the site where Madeline killed herself was murdered, which indicates that things aren't exactly as perfect as he, as he hoped they are, which is why there, we get this shot in black and white. Nonetheless, this is the point at which Scotty's fantasy is realized, and subsequently we see the complication of that that Hitchcock depicts when Scotty notices Judy putting on the necklace of Car Carlotta Valdez, the ancestor who purportedly fascinated Madeline. I have it. Well, how do you work this thing? Can't you see? Thank you. I'm just about ready. All I've got to do is find my lipstick. Where do I put it? I had it a minute ago. What if it's here? Here it is. There, I'm ready. Must me a little. Scott, I do have you now, don't I? How would you like to go someplace out of town for dinner? Maybe we could drive down the peninsula. All right, if you like. Okay. So the discoverer of this necklace is the encounter with the gaze for the spectator, even though the fact that Madeline was Judy does not catch the spectator by surprise. This seems like an encounter with the gaze for Scotty rather than the spectator, and it is. So Scotty realizes that all of what he thought was real was just created for his look to catch his desire. 
So he learns that the lost object, the perfect object, Madeline, he's recovered this lost object in the form of Judy. He learns that Madeline never really existed, that she was just created for his desire. But Scotty's just a character in the film. So his encounter with the gaze shouldn't be an encounter with the gaze for us necessarily. The difference between Scotty and the spectator at the moment when he sees the necklace is that the spectator has already seen a flashback, which reveals just how Judy has acted the part of Madeline. Thus, for the spectator, the revelation is no revelation at all, which is why some critics view the flashback as an error on Hitchcock's part, as a diminution of the power of Scotty's discovery of the necklace for the spectator. So we don't get the radical, crushing discovery that Madeline was a fake all the time at this moment because we've already had it earlier in the narrative of the film. But the flashback has the effect of aligning the spectator with Judy at this pivotal point. Our knowledge as spectator, spectators is on a par with Judy's knowledge in the film, not with Scotty's. Unlike earlier in the film, when our ignorance about the identity of Madeline paralleled Scotty. So Hitchcock structures the spectator's knowledge in this way in order to facilitate an encounter with the gaze as the stripping away of the phantasmatic possibility of a complete enjoyment. As a result of the flashback, the spectator experiences the discovery of Carlotta's necklace not as a recognition that Madeline as an impossible object never really existed. This is what happens to Scotty. But instead, as the destruction of Scotty's apparently complete enjoyment in having the object. In this key scene, it is Scotty, not Judy, who is shrouded in the fantasy of complete enjoyment, which is why, just before Judy comes out of the bathroom and puts on the necklace, Hitchcock includes a, sh includes a shot of Scotty sitting in a chair in Judy's apartment, surrounded by a halo of luminous green light from the neon signs outside the window behind him. Hitchcock includes this shot to indicate that at this moment, Scotty is immersed in a fantasy space, that the subsequent realization that Judy was Madeline destroys as it deprives him of this lost object that he thinks he's recovered. The revelation occurs in a shot of Scotty hooking the clasp of the necklace for Judy. Hitchcock shows Scotty seeing the necklace in the mirror and immediately thinks back to the portrait of Carlotta in the museum that Madeline used to spend hours staring at, although this was just Judy acting the part of, the Ma of Madeline staring at the picture. Before the film reveals the identity of the necklace, it shows Scotty's shocked reaction. He leans back away from Judy as the camera tracks toward him. The look on his face registers that the enjoyment of a few moments earlier has disintegrated as the illusory status of Madeline becomes evident to him. Hitchcock focuses on Scotty at the moment of the revelation because he has become the phantasmatic object for the spectator. When his enjoyment collapses, his status in the film undergoes a dramatic transformation. So it's the look on Scotty's face that is the gaze, not our look at Judy. So it's actually the man in Vertigo that's the gaze object, not the woman. This moment at which we see Scotty understanding that the scene was made for him is also the moment at which we understand that Vertigo was made for us. So this is the moment at which we recognize our own desire taken into account by the film. The encounter with the gaze not only exposes how the subject's desire shapes the nature of all reality, and that Gavin and Judy created Madeline to trap Scotty's desire, but also the dependence of this reality, reality on our belief in a naive other who has complete faith in the reality he inhabits. By giving the spectator the knowledge that Scotty doesn't have, Hitchcock establishes Scotty as this naive other, whom the spectator imagines can be protected from the devastating knowledge about Madeline's non-existence. The protection fails when Scotty recognizes the necklace. At this moment, the gaze strips away the naive other from the spectator, thereby cutting off our ability to believe in the possibility of some complete enjoyment through this figure of naivete. The scene in which Scotty recognizes the necklace and the spectator encounters the gaze is the highlight of Vertigo. It comes on the heels of a scene in the apartment when Judy fully remakes herself again as Madeline for Scotty. We see them kissing, bathed in neon green light through the 360-degree tracking shot that evinces Scotty's unlimited enjoyment that the film invites the spectator to partake in. Hitchcock gives the spectator the image of complete enjoyment 
only to subsequently rip it away and expose its illusoriness. That is to say, our enjoyment depends on a naive other that the encounter with the gaze completely eliminates. The gaze proliferates in Citizen Kane, but just as in Vertigo, the encounter with it becomes unavoidable at the moment of the film's most important revelation. The film begins with the final word of Charles Foster Kane. This word, rosebud, engenders a search by the reporter Jerry Thompson for its significance and thus for the secret of Kane's desire. So the entire film is an attempt to understand Kane's desire and discover what that desire is. Thompson interviews several of Kane's closest friends and associates, and the film shows their recollections as flashbacks that depict, Kane, depict Kane's life in a fragmentary form. Despite the abundance of information that Thompson discovers about Kane, he doesn't find the significance of Rosebud. He ends up telling himself that we may never know someone's secret, that no one is reducible to a single word. Many viewers of the film accept Thompson's skepticism about the other's desire, but doing so requires walking out of the theater prior to the scene that follows Thompson's statement. Just after Thompson proclaims the unknowability of anyone's desire, the film concludes with a worker at the Kane mansion throwing Kane's childhood sled into a fire. Let's look at that scene. Charles Foster Kane or Rosebud? How about it, Jerry? <laughs> What's Rosebud? That's what he said when he died. Did you ever find out what it means? No, I didn't. What did you find out about him, Jerry? Not much, really. We better get started. What have you been doing all this time? Playing with a jigsaw puzzle? If you could have found out that Rosebud meant, I bet that would have explained everything. No, I don't think so. No. Mr. Kane was a man who got everything he wanted and then lost it. Maybe Rosebud was something he couldn't get or something he lost. Anyway, it wouldn't have explained anything. I don't think any word can explain a man's life. No, I guess Rosebud is just a piece in a jigsaw puzzle. A missing piece. Well, come on, everybody. We'll miss the train. So it's important that the last word of the film is junk. So Rosebud is not anything special. It's just another ordinary object, a sled. And nonetheless, it indicates the secret of Cain's desire. The point is not that, oh, if Cain had stayed with his parents in Colorado, 
which is, which is what the sled represents, instead of moving to New York to become an important man, that he would have had a genuinely fat, satisfying existence. Instead, the sled indicates Cain's desire for what can never be refound. So the sled is important only insofar as it's missing. It's an impossible object. By structuring the film around the search for an object to attach to the signifier rosebud, Wells associates the object with the promise of realizing the spectator's desire. And in fact, our desire is realized at the very end of the film. Unlike the characters in the film, we really see what Rosebud is. The object remains absent within the, absent within the film's visual field throughout the running time and only appears when the film ends. But even when it appears, the way that Wells shoots it and this use of the term junk to describe it makes clear that Sled cannot realize our desire as spectators or Kane's desire as a subject. Wells shows the insignificance of the Sled by juxtaposing it with thousands of other objects that Kane accumulated. While watching it burn, the spectator experiences the object's failure to do what the signifier promises. In this sense, the Sled incarnates the gaze for the spectator and the disappointed exclamation, it's just a Sled, is entirely appropriate. Though Rosebud initially suggests a great past love or some other sublimity for the spectator and for Thompson, who the, who's investigating, it turns out to be nothing but a sled, which is why it functions as the, as the gaze. The gaze is the point of an excessive nothing within the plenitude of the image. And when the spectator sees it and recognizes it as a solution to Cain's desire, the emptiness of this desire becomes readily apparent. When we recognize that Rosebud is just a sled, that's the point of the gaze because that's the point at which our desire is manifested in the film. The disappointment that we feel is the disappointment that reflects our investment in the events that have taken place and the fact that these events have been shaped around our desire. And it's this moment of the sled being realized, the sled being made manifest and us recognizing it. That is the point at which our desire becomes visible and palpable within the visual field. And thus, this is the point at which we have to see ourselves in what we're looking at. We can no longer separate ourselves from the image and maintain a safe distance. So the safe distance from the image breaks down at this key point in Citizen Kane, which makes this, I think, the high point in the history of cinema. No one within the diegesis of the film recognizes the sled as Rosebud. But as it burns, the spectator loses the hope that someone might genuinely recognize Cain, like Thompson or someone else, and figure out the importance of his dying word. Like Hitchcock, Wells creates a divide between the spectator's knowledge and that of the characters within the diegetic reality of the film. And he does so in order to facilitate an encounter with the gaze. When no one recognizes the sled, the spectator must confront the absence of any ultimate record of subjectivity within the order of the film and within society. Even in the case of a subject as important as Cain, desire simply disappears without anyone noticing. Through this depiction, Citizen Cain extends the political significance of the encounter with the gaze. If spectators grasp what's at stake in this display of the gaze, it opens up a radical freedom for the subject because it reveals that the other cannot see the subject and ultimately doesn't care about us. Wells focuses on a rich and powerful man to show that even in his case, the other, all the society, societal forces, treat the subject with disregard. The other's demand for the proper orientation of our desire, as manifested in Citizen Kane, conceals a profound indifference to this desire. The gaze is the point of this disregard, the point at which the subject shatters the illusion of the other's omniscience. The problem with film as an art form is that Vertigo and Citizen Kane are exceptions. Even with these films, though critics universally acknowledge their aesthetic greatness, few see the link between their aesthetic breakthrough and their political one, a link that is necessary for understanding what constitutes a political film, a film that would encourage spectators to become politically engaged subjects. Leftist critics have historically struggled with the question of the relationship between aesthetics and politics. Theorists have been unable to reconcile the call for a politicized art with the aesthetic demands of artistic form without lapsing into dogmatism or aestheticism. The theory of the gaze has the great virtue of answering the question of the relationship 
between aesthetics and politics, at least in the cinema. Through the manner that a film deploys or obscures the gaze, its aesthetic significance and its political engagements come together. The power of cinema to precipitate a politicized subjectivity does not reside in its content, in its ability to depict the horrors of capital's production or the formation of a proletarian class consciousness. It lies rather in the formal capacity that cinema acquires through the role that the gaze has in cinematic art. The spectator's encounter with the gaze is a formal encounter, but its importance outstrips whatever revelation cinema can make in its content. In 1968, Jean-Luc Godard proclaimed an end to narrative cinema. It was for him nothing but an ideological trap for spectators, and his subsequent career has been a chronicle of its abandonment in favor of the radical juxtaposition of images. But the phantasmatic narrative that Hollywood employs to lure eager spectators into its ideological betrayal of the gaze is not necessarily ideological. Phantasmatic narrative is the political battleground of cinema. Alfred Hitchcock and Orson Welles show that a politically engaged subjectivity can emerge from this narrative form. It is always the site of the greatest political potential that gives birth to the most extreme ideological manipulation. This is how we have to think about the cinema. The unique relationship that cinema has to the gaze creates a political opening that ideological forces work, work tirelessly to obscure. But ultimately, this opening remains visible. The task for the spectator is one of seeing the gaze even amid the most sustained efforts to hide it.